What's up guys? If you have a test for radicals or you just need a quick refresher, that is the purpose of this video. What I'm going to do is just kind of informally run through this, kind of like I was teaching a class and my students just need a one day review of everything they've learned for that chapter. That's exactly what this video is going to do. So the first thing, let's just kind of run through. And again, we'll get into some basics as well as touch on some more difficult problems, but it's just going to be a summary of a lot of the points that you're going to want to make sure you know from this unit on radicals. So the first thing obviously is what exactly is a radical. Again, when we have this, this is what we call the index. And then under our radical is what we call the radicand. Okay. Now the index is basically indicating how many times something is being multiplied by ourself. Now, remember when we have a radicand, if it has a, as it's listed as an exponent, then remember we have an exponent. This is called our base and this is going to be called our power. And again, what the power represents here is how many times we are going to repeat the base being multiplied by itself, right? So x squared is equal to an x times x. Well, for instance, when I have like the square root of x squared, right? When this is saying what number multiplied by itself two times gives me an x squared. Well, that answer is going to be a x. And another way to think about that as like numbers, if I had the square roots, again, you could put the two there, but a lot of times we don't write the two in there. But if I had like nine, we could say, well, what number multiplied by itself gives us a nine? Well, we all know that a nine can be written as a three squared. So therefore the square root of three squared is going to equal of three. And that's one of the big powerful meshes that we have to understand is this right here. The nth root of something raised to the nth power is just going to equal the base of that exponent, which in this example is going to be X. All right. So let's just go and look at a couple other examples with some numbers here. So for instance, if I had like the cube root of 64, now a lot of students will look at this and they say, Oh, the 64, that's a square number, right? But don't do this like a eight squared because you can't simplify this. See how the three and two are not the same. That's not going to allow us to simplify that. However, what we can do is we can say, well, 64, that's also a four cubed. Now you can see, right? The three are the same. The index and the power are the same. So therefore this answer is going to equal to a four. Another thing we can look at is let's go and look at numbers. So if I had the, let's say the square root of X to the sixth power, again, this is a two here, right? So we want this to be raised to the second power. Now there's many, many different ways to be able to do this. And you might've found out, right? That we could do this by the linear factorization. We could write this out as X times X times X times X times X. And we're looking for something multiplied by itself. We can say that's going to be a pair. So we group these nice little pairs. And then we say, okay, well, we have, you know, since this is a pair, right, that's really the same thing as a x squared times a x squared times a x squared. Now what I want to do is introduce you again to the rules of exponents. So it's really important to remember these. These are going to be some very important rules to remember. So remember if I had the square root of a times the square root of b, that is equal to the square root of a times b. Well, this is important because it also works the other way. If I had the square root of a times b, that's equal to the square root of a times the square root of b. So what that means is I can now rewrite this as the square root of x squared times the square root of x squared times the square root of x squared, right? And the square root of x squared, right? Again, remember these are all square roots, right? So since these all share the same power and index, this can be written as a x times x times x, which is going to be an x cubed. However, there's an easier way for us to be able to do this. Because again, if I can rewrite this x to the sixth power as being something raised to the third power, then I can go ahead and simplify that. So the way I'm not going to do that is to go ahead and take this as a x squared and then raise it to the third power. Now, yes, x squared raised to the third power is x to the sixth. But again, remember, this has an index of two. These need to match, right? And even though these two match, this two is being raised to the third power. So we can't simplify it. So what we are going to want to do is we're going to want to rewrite this, the square root of a x cubed squared. Now you can see that the index and the power are exactly the same, just like we started with. And then now we know that that's going to simplify to an x cubed. So it doesn't really matter if you like the long way or if you prefer the short way, but you need to understand our idea of simplifying radicals because it's going to come up when we multiply, when we divide and when we add and subtract. Now, the other thing I want to go over with you is when we are dealing with our negatives. So just remember when I have like the square root of 64, we know that answer is eight because a eight squared, right? Square root of eight squared is just going to equal eight. However, if I have the square root of negative 64, under our real number system, we cannot do this, right? Because negative eight squared is actually equal to the square root of 64. 
So we cannot take the square root of negative numbers, at least in our real number system. However, we can take the cube root of negative numbers. So we can't take the even root, a square root, a fourth root, a sixth root of any negative radicands. However, we can take the odd root, the cube root, the fifth root of our negative powers. And the reason why is because if I take the cube root, uh, let's say of negative four raised to the third power, right? Negative four times negative four times negative four is indeed equal to a negative 64. So therefore this answer is going to be a negative four. So don't automatically freak out when you see a negative radicand because we definitely can simplify using our odd root. All right, so now let's go and get into a, another example um, that we can work into. So in this case, I have the fourth root of 48, a to the fourth, b to the sixth, c to the eighth, d to the 10th. So just remember what we've, you know, kind of been talking about here. If we want to go ahead and simplify this, we want to be able to rewrite 48 as a product of a number raised to the fourth power. When we're dealing with square numbers, you have to know your square numbers, right? You have to know 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, 64, 81, 100, 121, 144, 169, 196, 225, right? You should know those square numbers. You should also know your cube numbers. For the quartic numbers, I wouldn't be really as concerned about many knowing many of them. Hopefully you're going to have a calculator, but you should probably know like two, three, and four, or at least five up to at the, like, the very least, or at least just be familiar with them. But a lot of times that's going to be getting into pretty big numbers. And you can see here that the smallest um, quartic number that I'm aware of, besides one, obviously, is going to be 16. And that's going to be two raised to the fourth power. So two raised to the fourth power is equal to a 16. Now, 16 is divisible into 48. So my whole goal here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite my number as a product of 16, right? Because I can take the fourth root of 16, which is two to the fourth. So that'll be a 16, and then that's gonna be times three. Now for my powers, again, what I wanna do is you could use the product rule, you could use the power rule. We could use a lot of different rules in four in this case. What I'm gonna do here is a to the fourth is already written as a to the fourth, so I don't need to do anything here. So I'm just gonna leave it just like that. And then b squared, I am actually going to rewrite that as a, again, we wanna rewrite that as b to the fourth times a b squared right? Because again, we want things to be raised to the fourth power. For c to the eighth, I'm actually going to use the power rule here. I'm going to say this is a c squared raised to the fourth power. And then for d to the 10th, what I want to do is get as close to 10 as I possibly can with using the fourth root and then multiply it by any other terms that I have. So for d to the 10th, I will do d squared raised to the fourth power. Now that gives me d to the 10th. If, I'm sorry, d to the eighth. If I want to get d to the 10th, I'll just multiply by another d squared. Now, the next thing I want to do here is separate my using the product rule. I'm just going to break up into everything that I can take the fourth root of compared to everything I cannot take the fourth root of. Okay, so I can take the square root of 16, which is going to be a two to the fourth times a a to the fourth times a b to the fourth times a c squared to the fourth times a d squared to the fourth. And then I'm going to multiply times everything that I could not take the fourth root of. So that's going to leave me with a three times a B squared times a D squared, right? Because this is basically going to remain unchanged. Now for all of these, you could break them up individually if you wanted to. But again, like with time, you don't even need to separate these. I'm just going a little bit, um, a little bit more detail just to make sure you know, you can see where, why we can take the fourth root of these and why we can't take the fourth root of these because they're not raised to the fourth power. So therefore what I'll be left with is a two times a to the fourth times b to the fourth times a c oops i'm sorry <laughs> what is the fourth root of two to the fourth that's just a two fourth root of a to the fourth is an a fourth root of b to the fourth is a b fourth root of c squared squared is a c squared fourth root of d squared to the fourth going to be a d squared and that's gonna be all multiplied by the fourth root of a three b squared D squared. Now the next example we can talk about is going to be on for multiplying. So for that, I could have like a four square root of a eight Y times a three times three times a seven Y squared X. Obviously you could go ahead and simplify these if you wanted to, but a lot of times when multiplying the radicands, as long as the index is the same, I've just found it's going to be easier to go ahead and multiply them. So in this case, I can multiply my two numbers on the outside. So four times three is going to be a 12. And then for over here, I'm multiplying these radicands. I'll have eight times seven, which is going to be a 56. Y times Y squared is going to be a Y cubed. And then I only have an X here. So we'll just rewrite that as an X. Now when I'm taking the square root, now we're just going to do a simplifying problem. So I'm going to have the 12, which is multiplying the outside. Um, now what I want to identify here is how many times does 16 go and divide into 56? I know four divides into 56 is going to be a 14 times. So I can say four times 14. 
and then I can rewrite a y cubed as y squared times y and then times an x. Now what I can do is I can just take the square root of my 4, so that's going to be a times 2, and I can take the square root of y squared, which will be times a y. Then what's left over here is going to be a 14, a y, and an x. So I'll go ahead and write that there for y, x, and therefore I'm left with a 24y times the square root of 14 y to the x. Now that's for multiplying two radicals. But what if we have our radical expression? So another famous thing we need to make sure we have, or another famous expression, if what I've had the square root of 8 minus the square root of 12 quantity squared. So it's really important to make sure we recognize this, that we can rewrite this as the square root of 8 minus the square root of 12 times the square root of 8 minus the square root of 12. Now in this example, I know I can simplify the square root of 8 and the square root of 12, so I'm just going to do that on the onset. But remember, when anything's squared, it just means it's multiplied by itself. So let's go ahead and simplify the square root of 8. I know I can rewrite that as a 4 times 2. And square root of 12, I can rewrite that as a 4 times 3. Okay, so therefore this can be simplified into a 2 minus the square root of 2 minus a 2 times square root of 3. Okay, now again, that's a quantity squared here. So let's go ahead and now rewrite this in our expanded form. So 2 square root of 2 minus a 2 square root of 3 times a 2 square root of 2 minus a 2 square root of 3. Okay, so now in this case, we can just multiply first term times first term. And remember, multiply your coefficients and then multiply your radicand. So 2 times 2 is going to be a 4 times the square root of 4. Now, I know you could probably say that's 2, but let's just keep things as they are for now for some accounting reasons. First term times my last term is going to be a negative 4 times the square root of 6. Then I'll go ahead and take my inner terms, and again, that's also going to be give me a negative 4 times square root of 6, and then my last two terms, which is going to give me a positive 4, and then that's going to be times the square root of 9. So now let's just go ahead and simplify some things. So square root of 4, and we know is going to be 2. 2 times 4 is going to equal a 8. These are going to be the same, right? So negative 4 plus negative 4 is going to be a negative 8 square root of 6, right? It's just like saying negative 4x minus 4x, right? It's the exact same thing. That's going to be a negative 8x. So you can kind of treat the square root of 6 as kind of like that variable there. And then square root of 9 is going to be 3. 3 times 4 is going to be a 12. Now I can go ahead and combine these. So that's going to give me a 20 minus 8 square root of 6. Now, my final answer is going to be a 20 minus a 8 square root of 6. Now, it's important to understand that we cannot combine these, right? Because we cannot combine this 20 and an 8 because this 8 is being multiplied by 6. But that does bring us into, well, when can we add and subtract our radicals? Okay, so we can only add and subtract or combine terms when our radicands and index is the same, right? So a cube root and a square root cannot be combined. Square roots and cube roots can be combined, but only when the radicands are the same. So if the radicands are not the same, just don't give up. What you want to do is kind of simplify, just like we kind of did in this example over here. Look to simplify them first. So I want to say, all right, how can I rewrite this as a square number? Well, again, I can rewrite this 27 as a 9 times 3. And I can rewrite here as going to be 4 times the square root of 4 times 3. And again, I can take the square root of 9. I can take the square root of 4. So that's going to be a negative 2 times a 3, square root of 3, plus a 4. Square root of 4 here is going to be a 2 times the square root of 3. Now when I go ahead and simplify this, I get a negative 6 square root of 3 plus a 8 square root of 3. Now you can see the index is the same, right? They're both square roots and my radicands are both the same. So now I can just take the coefficients, negative six plus eight is going to be a two square root of three, right? Because negative six plus eight, we know is going to be a two. Negative six x plus eight x or is equal to say two x. And it doesn't really matter if it's y, if it's x, if it's square roots, um, if it's thetas, it can be anything. So just remember these are your, since we have that common terms here, we can just go and combine our coefficients. Now a lot of students get messed up with dividing, but just again, remember there's another rule that we need to make care of. If I have the square root of A divided by B, that can be rewritten as the square root of A over the square root of B. But also the same thing, if I have the square root of A over the square root of B, then I can just rewrite that as one whole fraction of A over B. The next thing that students usually get struggled with is rationalizing the denominator because a lot of times we say rationalize the denominator, but we don't really give a good reason for doing it. Basically, the main idea of why we want to do it is get the radical off the denominator. And a lot of times it's going to help us do some more difficult mathematical processes, but the operation for rationalizing the denominator with a monomial, a binomial, or cube roots is different. So that's why I want to go through an example here of each of those so you can kind of see the difference as well as how to do them. But before we do that, let's just go through a simple division problem, making sure we understand how to do something like this. So if I have the 10 over the square root of 5, our main goal is to get rid of 5. Now again, how do I get rid of the square root of 5? Well, I can't simplify the square root of 5. However, I can simplify the square root of 5 squared. What can I multiply by square root of 5 to make it equal the square root of 5 squared? And yes, your answer is 
if x is equal to the square root of 5. Because what is the square root of 5 times the square root of 5? Square root of 5 times the square root of 5 is equal to the square root of 5 squared. Right? So that's what we want to do. We just want to multiply by the exact same radicand to get our radicand squared, which will then simplify. Now, again, what you want to do, though, is you have to make sure you do that on the numerator as well as on the denominator, because that's going to do what we call produce equivalent fractions. So for instance, if I had 3 over 6, right, as long as I multiply by 2 on the top and the bottom, that's going to give me a 6 over 12. Well, is 3 over 6 equivalent to 6 over 12? Yes, they're both equal to 1 half. So when I go ahead and simplify this, I get a 10 squared of 5 over a 5. Now again, remember, we can still simplify this, right? The 5 divides into 10 two times, so therefore that's going to leave me with a 2 square root of 5. Now be careful though, because that works when you have a monomial down there, but we have a little bit different process here if we have like a binomial, okay? So we don't want to multiply by 1 minus square root of 5, like we, you know, the same whatever's in the denominator over here. What in this case, what we need to do is multiply by what we call the conjugate. So to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to multiply by 1 plus the square root of 5. The reason why we want to do that, the reason why we don't want to multiply by the square root of 5 is because the square root of 5 has to distribute to both of those. And yes, that will get rid of the radical with the 5, but when you multiply the square root of 5 times 1, that's going to still have a radical in the denominator. The cool thing about multiplying here is this is actually going to give us the difference of two squares. And the difference of two squares, if you remember, eliminates my middle term, which in this example is going to be where the radical happens. So now let's go and see how this works out. Now for the numerator, I'm just going to leave this as a product because something might simplify out once I multiply out my denominator. So down here, I'll just go ahead and use FOIL. So 1 times 1 is going to be 1. 1 times positive square root of 5 is going to be a positive square root of 5. Negative square root of 5 times 1 is going to be negative square root of 5. Do you see how these now add to 0? They get eliminated. Negative square root of 5 times positive square root of 5, that's going to be a negative 5. Now that goes to 0. So what that's going to leave me with here is going to be a 10 times 1 plus the square root of 5 all over now a negative 4, which again, I can reduce this. And again, since this is separated by multiplication, I can divide this negative 4 with the 10, right? It's basically just like rewriting it like this times a 1 plus the square root of 5. Now, again, negative 4 does not evenly divide into 10 like we did up here, right? But we can reduce this. We can divide just like we multiplied the top and the bottom by the same thing. We can also divide by the same thing, right? You're still producing equivalent fractions, right? Because if you take a look at uh, what I had here, if I had 6 over 12 and what? If I divided by 2, I get a 3 over 6. So you're still producing equivalent fractions. So over here, if I divided a 10 and a negative 4 by 2, what that would leave me with here is going to be a negative 5 halves times a 1 plus the square root of 5. All right, now the last thing I want to mention to you is just something really important. Um, again, is what if we had 10 over the cube root of 5? Because a lot of students will say, oh, well, then we'll just multiply by the cube root of 5 here, right? And on the top and the bottom. But the problem here is what is the cube root of 5 times the cube root of 5? Well, that's going to be the cube root of 5 squared. That cannot simplify, right? So what we want to do, if we want to get, remember our goal here is we want to get the cube root of 5 cubed, right? Because the cube root of 5 cubed is going to equal a 5. That's our whole goal. So rather than multiplying by just a 5, we want to multiply by a 5 squared, which is technically 25, but I'm going to write it like that so you can see what's going on here. So in my numerator here, I'll have a 10 times the cube root of 5 squared. And in my denominator here, I'll have the cube root of 5 times the cube root of 5 squared, which is going to be the cube root of 5 cubed. So again, you can see here how this now simplifies just to a 5. So I'll have a 10 cube root, and now I'll write this as a 25 all over 5. Well, again, just like in our last example, 5 divides into a 10. That's going to be 2 times. So therefore, I can rewrite this as a 2 cube root of 25. Now, what if we have a problem like this? Do we really have to go ahead and rationalize the denominator with each and every one of these terms? It kind of seems like a lot, doesn't it? Now, you might say, well, I could probably simplify the b to the fourth, and I could simplify up here the a squared, but still, it kind of seems like a lot. You're going to have to simplify it and then rationalize the denominator. So just remember, go back to your rules, right? I can rewrite this as 10a squared b cubed all over a 5a b to the fourth. The reason why this is so important, because now I can use my rules of exponents to simplify this expression. And when I go ahead and simplify this expression, I can just do 10 divided by 5. Well, that's going to be a 2. a squared divided by a to the first power, right, is just going to be an a. And then b cubed divided by b to the fourth here is going to be a simple b. Now I might say, okay, well, now what do I do with this? Well, now what I can do is I can rewrite this. I can go back to splitting it up. So that's going to be a square root of a over a square root of b. Now we're just into rationalizing the denominator with one term, right? And again, how do I simplify this square root of b? To get rid of that, I want that to be a b squared. So I'll multiply by the square root of b 
on the top and the bottom. Now, again, since I'm multiplying radicands with the same index, that can go on the inside or multiply it to it. And then this is going to leave me a b square to b times square to b is going to be a square to b squared, which is just a b. So I can rewrite this as a two a b all over b, which you could also, if you wanted to, just like write it in front, like a one over b times the square root of two a b. So going back to this rules of exponents reminds me that we need to kind of do some review of these rules of excellence because another way that we can write radicals is by using our rational powers. And to be good at rational powers, you have to know your rules of exponents. So let's go through and rewrite our rules of exponents just to make sure that we have them. So just remember we have the power rule. So if I have a to the m times a to n equals a to the m plus n, we have the quotient rule. So a to the m over a to the n equals a a to the m minus n. We have the product rule, a to the m raised to the n equals a to the m times n. We have the power to product rule. So if I have a times b raised to the n, that is equal to an a to the n, b to the n. And we have the product to quotient rule or power to quotient rule. So if I have a to the a divided by b to the n, that is equal to an a to the n over a b to the n. We also have our negative exponent rule. So if I had a a to the negative one, that equals one over a to the, oh, I'm sorry, let's do m. If I had one over a to the m, I can rewrite that as a to the negative m. And then just remember if I had a to the zero, that is gonna equal a one. So those are your rules of exponents that you're gonna to want to remember, but it's also important to, to recognize how do we rewrite a radical with rational powers? So remember, if I have the square root or the nth root of something raised to the nth power, that is equal to n. Now there's another way that we can go ahead and rewrite this. What if n was not the same for my index and my power? What if I had a root of x to the b? Now, if I wanted to rewrite this, I could also rewrite this as what we call a rational power. So that's gonna be x to the b over a. So you can always think the denominator is gonna be the same thing as the index. So the power is always gonna still be like the power, right? So it's still the power, it's just gonna be divided by whatever the index is. So this is pretty important because again, when we want to simplify some expressions or solve some expressions, rewriting them a lot of times using rational powers and using that can be a lot of times helpful. So just remember, you know, if I had the x to the square root of x, that can be written as x to the one half power because there's technically a one here and a two here. And another example here, if I had the you know cube root of x squared, well, that can be written as a x to the two thirds power. So again, just make sure that you can go ahead and rewrite those. Remember, the index is going to be the same as the base, okay? You know, if you don't have an index written there, remember that's two. If you don't have a power written there, remember we can always use that to be one. So here's a quick little example of just kind of like what we did before. Like if I had two X over the cube root of Y, we know we need to rationalize the denominator, but again, what is really like, how do we know multiplying by that squared really kind of works? So another thing that you can do is just rewrite this as rational powers, right? That's going to be one. So therefore this can be written as a one to the third. Now, remember the rules of exponents. When you multiply your exponents, right? What are you doing? You're actually adding the powers. So our whole goal, when we're eliminating our radical, we want that to be one, right? We want our denominator to be y to the first power. So what do I need to add to a one third to be able to get that to be one? Well, that's gonna be a two thirds, right? Because if I multiply this by y to the two thirds, what are you doing with this? You're doing one third plus two thirds, which is equal to three thirds. And three thirds is equal to one. So I'm gonna do that on the top and the bottom. So what that's gonna do is, let's go and see, that will now give me a two x y to the two thirds and then my denominator will be y to the three thirds, which is just technically a y to the first power. Now, what I can simply do is rewrite this back in radical form. So two x, and that'll be a cube root of y squared all over a y. So a lot of times keeping them as radicals is gonna be the preferred choice, but also a lot of times using them as rational powers is now going to allow you to work the problem differently using your rules of exponents. So sometimes it's beneficial, sometimes it's not. And then sometimes you're actually gonna have problems written as rational powers and you're not gonna rewrite them as radicals. So for example, what if I had a two x to the negative 10th divided by a y to the fifth, all raised to the two fifth power. Now you could convert these into radicals if you really wanted to, but again, let's just simplify this using the rules of exponents. So, and what I like to do is always get rid of my negative powers usually first. So I can do that by now just putting that in my denominator. So then I really have is a two divided by x to the 10th, y to the fifth raised to the two fifth power. Now using my power to quotient rule, remember this two fifths is going to everything. So I have two to the two fifths divided by, now again, we have a product down here. So it's the power to product rule as well as the power to product rule. So I have a X to the 10th raised to the two fifths power, right? Because it's being distributed to each of these as well as a Y to the fifth being raised to the second power. 
Now, the cool thing is, remember, what does our power rule of exponents tell us? We're just going to simply go ahead and to multiply those. So now in this case, I can't really do anything, but I can rewrite this as a fifth root of two squared. And here I have 10 times two fifths. Well, five divides into 10, two times. So therefore that's gonna give me an X to the fourth. And then over here, uh, that's gonna be a Y to the 10th. Now, again, I don't need to rationalize these, right? There's no radicals. And I could just rewrite my numerator here as going to be the fifth root of four divided by X to the fourth, Y to the 10th. Okay, another quick example that we could do here is what if I had like nine to the one half times a nine to the two thirds raised to the one sixth power. Now you might want to simplify this to the square root of nine, but I would keep this exactly there because we have exponents with the base of the same. That means we can apply our rules of exponents here. So there's a couple different things we can do here. Recognize here that I have a product, right? They have the same base, so I can actually combine these. So therefore this is going to be a one half plus a two thirds. So now this is going to be testing our skills of adding fractions. So let's just do this to the side. So one half plus a two thirds, we need to get common denominators here, which is going to be the finding the LCD, which in this example is going to be six. So I'm going to multiply by two over two and then a three over three. So that's a three over six plus a four over six, which is a seven over six. Okay. So I can rewrite this as a nine raised to the seven over six power times a one over six. Now again, remember the power rule, we're going to multiply these. So it's going to be nine to seven, um, six times six is going to be a 36. And then I could leave it there because the problem was originally written with rational power. So we can leave it like that. But let's just pretend, let's say it was a multiple choice problem and we need to rewrite this as a radical. Remember that is your index. So therefore it'd be nine to the seventh power, which I have no idea what that is, but it's probably a pretty big number. Probably it is. Next thing I just want to go through is just solving our square root uh, equation. So it's just important when we have something like a two X plus nine, minus two equals five. So always use your inverse operations to isolate our radicand. So the only thing that's being applied to my radical in this case is going to be a two. So I'm going to add a two to both sides. Therefore, I'm going to be left with a two X plus nine is equal to a seven. Now, if I did have like a three over here, I would divide a three on both sides, right? But I don't have a three, so I'm not going to do that. But in case, if you did have something multiplied, that'd be another idea that you are going to want to do. You want to isolate this radical, because now what we have to do is we have to say, all right, if the opposite of subtracting is addition, right? If the opposite of multiplication is division, what is the opposite of taking the square root? Well, the opposite inverse operation here is squaring. So we're just going to square both sides. So when we square both sides, I get a 2x plus 9 is equal to a 49. Now we're just going to use our inverse operations again to now solve for my x. So I have a minus 9, and then I have a 2x equals a 40, divide by 2, divide by 2, and then x is going to equal 20. Now it's very important when we square both sides and solving a radical equation, we have to look for extraneous solutions. Those are basically solutions that would solve this equation, but don't satisfy my original equation. So it's important to remember the only restriction that we really have with radicals is we can't take the square root of a negative number. So I'm just going to plug in 20 just to make sure that that does not make my radicand negative, which is to not. So therefore this is going to be your solution. Now, another example that we could have is if we had like radicals on both sides. So we have an x minus five, x minus five is equal to a two x minus four. So we have radicals on both sides. It's the same idea, right? We want to get rid of these radicals. So we're going to square both sides. Now when we go ahead and do that. What I'm going to get is a x plus five equals a two x minus four. Now again, this is a two-step equation. So we're going to go ahead and solve. So I have a negative five equals x minus four, add a four, add a four. I get negative one is equal to x. But there's a problem here because remember when I said, be careful when you get your solutions, you could have an extraneous solution. This doesn't work. Because when I plug in a negative one into this radical over here, I get a negative one minus five, and that's going to be a square root of negative six. Remember, we can't take the square root of a negative number. So even though this is a solution to this equation, it's not a solution to your original equation. That is what we call an extraneous solution. So just be careful. Make sure you're always checking your work once you get some answers. Now, another example that we could bring into is just using, again, inverse operations with using the cube root or rational power. So if I had two times a six X minus three raised to the one third power minus four equals a zero. Now again, I could just write this. Uh, this is the same thing as the cube root of six X minus three, right? Minus four equals zero. So whatever you're really familiar with, you don't have to be stuck with rational powers or with the cube root. You can now go back and forth. But again, the main thing we want to do is isolate my parentheses or isolate my radicand. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my inverse operation. So I have a two cube root of six X minus three is equal to four. Now you can divide by two on both sides and then you can have the cube root of six X minus three is equal to a two. Or if you want to rewrite that as a rational power, feel free. I don't really like the rational powers in this example because I like to think of my inverse operations. If the inverse operation of the square root is squaring, 
then what's the inverse operation of the cube root? That's cubing. You're right. So now when I cube both sides, I get a 6x minus 3 is equal to a 8. Now I can add a 3 to both sides, and that'll give me a 6x equals 11, divide by 6, divide by 6, x equals an 11 over 6. Now the cool thing about doing a problem like this for the cube root is we don't have to worry about extraneous solutions because anything negative is still going to satisfy our original example because you can take the cube root of a negative radicand. Last thing I want to bring up with the solving is going to be with inequalities. That's going to be again very important with our understanding of our restrictions. So for example, if I had 2x minus 5 plus 2 is greater than 5. Okay, so I'm going to use my inverse operations here. I'm going to subtract a 2 and then I'll have the square root of 2x minus 5 is going to be less than, or sorry, greater than three. Now again, just like an equation, I'm going to get rid of the square root by squaring both sides. So therefore that'll be a two X minus five is going to be greater than a nine. Now again, using my inverse operations here. So you say, all right, that's gonna be plus five. And I get a two X is going to be greater than 14. Divide by two, divide by two X is going to be greater than seven. But it's very important to also make sure whenever we're dealing with our radical, especially on an inequality, we want to make sure that we are taking into consideration the domain of the radical. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the radicand here, 2x minus 5, and we know, remember, our only restriction that we've talked about is we cannot take the square root of a negative number. So I'm going to take 2x minus 5 has to be greater than or equal to 0. And then I'll just go ahead and solve here. So I get a 2x is greater than or equal to a 5. Divide by 2, divide by 2, x is going to be greater than or equal to, what, 2.5. Now, if I look at this as on terms of a number line, and let's say here's 0 and here is 2.5, let's say here's seven. Well, if X is greater than or equal to, right, seven, but also both of these have to be true. So X is greater than seven. Well, if you notice that everything that's greater than seven is going to be true for both of these inequalities, right? Anything over here is not true. So therefore, my final answer is just going to be X is greater than seven. Now, the next thing I want to talk to you about is graphing. When you're graphing the radical functions, the main thing you want to be able to do is make sure you know the parent graph. So Y equals the square root of X, Right, that's going to look something like this. And it's really kind of important to kind of know a couple points. Uh, like you should know 0, 0. You should know 1, 1. And you probably should also know, let's see, um, 4, 2. 1, 2, 3, 4, 2. <laughs> kind of badly written there. But you should know those because, again, if you plug in each of these points, if you plug in 1, you should get 1, right? And if you plug in a 2, I'm sorry, you plug in a 4, then you're going to get out a 2. The other graph that I think it's important to know is going to be the cubic graph. So y equals the cube root of x. So that's going to look very similar. However, remember that the negatives are now a part of this domain, right? So we're going to have kind of like this positive part, but then what it's going to do is it kind of do this little S curve and it's going to go down from there. Exactly the same kind of thing with the cube root here. We have our point here, zero comma zero. You can also take a one comma one, but then also remember that negative one is also going to be a, a point on the graph as well. See how this graph, the domain here is all positive numbers. So it's important to write down the domain. So the domain here is going to be from zero to infinity. And I'm sorry, that should be a closed bracket because zero is defined. And then that's going to be an open parenthesis at infinity. And whereas the range is also going to be from zero to infinity. However, when we're looking at the cubic graph, notice that this is going to continuously expanding to the left as well as to the right, as well as continuously expanding up and down. So in this one, the domain is going to be all real numbers. And this one, the range is going to be all real numbers. So a lot of times when we need to graph them, what I like to do is just go ahead and pick a common point. And typically that common point is going to be zero comma zero. And we can just move that left and right or up and down. And the only other thing we'll want to make sure we understand is the reflections about the X or the Y axis. And if there is a general stretch or condense. So a couple of just examples we can go and take a look at is, you know, what if I had Y equals the square root of X plus two. Now, what I want you to notice is this plus two is going to be outside of the function. So what that's going to do is that's actually going to shift the graph up two units. So if I know what my parent graph is, and I know that parent graph has a point at zero comma zero, well, all I'm simply gonna do is just take this graph and shift it up two points. And that's gonna be what your graph is. Now, what about if I put that on the inside? So what if I had X plus two? So it's important for you to make the distinction of this is inside, and this one's going to be outside. So outside is going to be shifting up, or outside is going to be a vertical transformation, whereas inside is going to be a horizontal transformation. Now. It, a lot of students will like to think, well, if plus is up, then plus on the inside should be to the right. But there's a very big distinction that we need to understand about transformations. It doesn't matter what the function is. It doesn't matter if we're dealing with logarithms, if we're dealing with quadratics, absolute value, or radicals. When we're looking at the transformations, we have an A times B, 
x minus c plus d. Okay, so I want you to understand that this minus c, that is going to be the opposite of the shift. So if I want to actually identify what this is, what this transformation is, what I can technically do is rewrite this as a x minus a negative two. What is x minus negative two? Well, it's plus two, right? So I want you to understand that this value is negative. That's actually shifting the graph two units to the left. Now, the good thing about having some points here is we can justify our graph to make sure that it's going to work. So if I put in a, let's see, this is going to be two points to the left, right? And a lot of students will be like, I don't think you are right. So here's the pair graph, right? And then here is my new transformed graph right? Shifting it two units to left, not units two units to the right. So if this graph works, if it is two units to the left, that means the point negative two is on the graph. Well, let's plug in negative two into the function. Negative two plus two is zero. Square root of zero is zero. And look at negative two zero is a point on the graph. So at positive two, if you thought it was two units to the right and you plugged in positive two, two plus two is four, square root of four is two. Do you see how that point is not there? But four, you can see that point is there right? So that's why it's very important to kind of see or to know what your points are that you're dealing with. The other thing I want to add into this is our domain and range. So whenever we have a vertical transformation, the domain is not changing, right? The domain is going to be how far the graph is going to the left as well as to the right. So the domain in this case is going to be zero to infinity. However, since this graph shifted up two units, my range is now going to be from two to infinity. And in the same respect, whenever I'm having a horizontal transformation, my range is not going to change, but my domain is. So in this example, I have my domain is now being shifted two units to the left. So now my domain is going to be from negative two to infinity, and my range is going to be unchanged, which is going to be from zero to infinity, which you can see the graphs portray. The only other thing I want to mention in this is also going to be the reflection. So for example, if I have y equals a negative square root of x, I want you to understand that this again is going to be outside. So what that means is that's going to be a vertical reflection. So rather than the graph going up, it's going to be reflected vertically, which is the same thing as being reflected about the x axis. So this graph is going to look something like this. And if I had a reflection on the inside, so let's say y equals the square root of negative x, you can see that's in the inside. And remember, inside is horizontal transformation. So if I was going to reflect it horizontally, you can see that's going to be a reflection about the y axis. That is again going to reflect it across over here. So now again, we can see there's some changes to our domain and our range. So over here, since this is vertical, the domain did not change, but the range has now been shifted here to negative infinity to zero. And over here, you can see that now my domain is going to be from open parentheses, negative infinity to zero, whereas my range has been unchanged, which is going to be from zero to infinity. Now there are some more transformations which are going to be like vertical stretch and compression, or a horizontal stretch and compression. But the best thing I'd recommend is understanding if they're outside or inside. If you're multiplying by some numbers, which is typically going to be your A, that is going to be a vertical stretch or compression. When you're multiplying by a number on the inside, which is going to be your B, that is going to be your horizontal stretch or compression. I could go through some examples to reiterate those points. You can see my graphs are pretty well sketches. I'm not trying to be very exact. So I think it's important for you to be able to recognize the differences between the stretch, the compression, the horizontal shift, the vertical shift, and the reflections. But when you're stretching or compressing, that's not going to impact the domain. So that's why I just want to focus on these characteristics. So if you've been working through all these problems with me, I hope you gained a little bit of knowledge. If this video was beneficial for you, go ahead and give me a like or maybe a super thanks and please comment down below. I love hearing from your success and I wish you all the best. I have plenty more examples for you in the description as well as another video to help you with your math right here.